remarkable the intensity that this book can actually stir up. It, and then having said that, it's not the sort of book which I think is, is absolutely true. What it is, is a wonderful sweep of information. Um, Buck is a fascinating guy, <clears throat> and what we have in the book is a testament to somebody who's really quite, as they, they would say nowadays, left of field, coming into this subject almost from outside, like a complete beginner, and he sees something and pulls it together in a way that I don't think had been done before. And because of that, he defines it in a completely different way. And he's coming at something which is quite strange. Um, let's have a look at, at him first of all, because it's not often that the authors uh, have a fascinating life beyond the book. It's not, this wasn't the only book he wrote, but this is the one which he is famous for, and it's the one which is sort of relatively <coughs> successful. The other books are hang from this one. There he is. Um, you've got a little picture of him mm -hmm. on the thing. That's the only picture I could find of him. I've searched the internet and one or two other literary sources, and I can't find anything other than that about him. He's um, he wrote the book. It was the, he wrote the book in the 19, early 1900s. It took him about 20 years to write, and it was published after his death. Um, he was born English in a place called Methwall in England, I don't know where it is, I'm sure they invented it, it's made up name. Um, his family emigrated to Canada in the first year of his life. So he was born here and um, they emigrated to, to Canada. His father was a, a, a preacher. There were seven children, he was the seventh child. And they went to a place in Ontario, right out in the backwoods, where they, um, father took all these books with him, had a cabin full of books, it was said, but young Richard Book didn't go to school. So he was self-educated, or educated by his family and by this library of books over there. A lifelong fascination and interest in poetry, um, a very strong relationship with Walt Whitman, the poet, um, wrote a, a biography of him. Um, very powerfully influenced by the Romantic poets, um, but literally uh, a backwoodsman. I've got a, let me, uh, I've, I've sort of sent a, an email out to one or two people, to, uh, to Zohar actually, to, to get out to as many people as we could, sorry, and um, i just read a little bit from that because that was part of the, the bit which I gathered together, which I thought would maybe catch people's, people's interest. Book was a, a backwards Canadian adventurer, that's what he's classed as in, uh, in the blurbs about him, who rose to be president of both the psychological section of the British Medical Association and the American Medical Psychological Association. So he was president of both of those August bodies, and his book is to be considered a seminal influence on such folk as William James, who has, uh, in my copy of the book, there's a, in, in the foreword, there's a little uh, quote from William James completely endorsing the work of Richard Book. Um, William James, Otto Rank, and Carl Rogers, and also Uspensky, the, um, the student of Gurdjieff, mm -hmm. who actually takes him to task for about several of the points that he's made in uh, Tesha Organum, which um, is, is quite a powerful book in itself. So this fellow was very influential in that way. Um, I discussed this book on a couple of occasions with Eugene. He thought it was a very valuable book for getting things rolling. He didn't consider that the word cosmic consciousness was a good one. He said because the consciousness that he's talking about is beyond the cosmos. It's an order which is beyond. Cosmos means order, the ordered system. And what we're talking about is something which is beyond that. And actually, it appears organized within the cosmos, but actually it is beyond that. It's bigger than that. So he, he felt that the book had limited the, um, the scale of what he was talking about by that choice of word. I and mean, it is his choice of word. So um, that was the one thing Eugene said about it. But 
later on when we look at the the things which are which book forms out, you'll realise that an awful lot of the characters that he mentions are the ones that Eugene used to refer to. The quotes that we would get and the people we would be advised to study are the ones that actually book brings into into this thesis, if you like. <coughs> okay. Let's start with him. As I say, he was born in Methold in England in 1837. His father, sort of, and mother brought the whole family over to Ontario. A typical farm boy, he left home in the backwoods of Ontario aged 16. He travelled south into the US uh, for new sights and adventure. And he travelled first of all down to Columbus, Ohio, and then he went west to, to California. And he was a manual worker, which is what he'd been trained to on the farm. And in the study I, I was reading, actually, the other day, it was saying that it's worth mentioning that he spanned the time from when farming was purely a manual business up to when it was when it was mechanical. And when he was actually a farm boy, it would have taken probably, as the fellow said, about 14 hours a day of labour to keep the farm ticking over. And that, you know, they, they needed men because it was purely manpower in that sense. The women folk would be producing the food from what the men actually generated, but it was a tremendously intensive workload that they had. Um, so that in the backwards work where he's talking about, they would be virtually totally self-sufficient. You know, and coming into town maybe once a month or something. So anyway, he went off down into the US, to Columbus, Ohio, and then across to California, working man manually at odd jobs all along the way. And uh, he did jobs such as mining engineer, he worked in, um, which would probably mean more with a shovel than, than with a spanner, and, um, and then across the country working farming jobs, herding cattle, working on ships, etc., ferry boats and stuff. Um, he was part of a travelling party that had to fight for their lives. They were actually, it was a, it was gold prospecting at the time and uh, trying to find the gold valley in, in California. And they came under attack from the Shoshone Indians. Um, and uh, he was also organising a camp, um, a wagon train going west. So he was quite a character. I was reading this and uh, I, I nearly fell off the seat. And it had said um, he was nearly frozen to death in the mountains of California. And he was the sole survivor of a silver mining party. He had to walk over the mountains and he suffered severe exposure to frostbite in his feet. He lost one, one and a half feet in, uh, in, that, in the extreme weather. And then the thing that actually knocked me off his feet was he returned back to Canada at the age of 21. So in the, between 16 and 21, he'd gone down into the, he'd done all those different jobs, been attacked by Indians, run a camel through, uh, uh, sorry, a wagon train, and, uh, and lost two feet in a, in a mining, uh, uh, well, it was a severe winter, actually. He went out with two famous brothers who owned a silver mine, and um, while they were there, they, the whole thing, got, the winter had turned so severe on them that they, uh, they ran out of food and everything. He was sent to try and, try and get help. All the others died, and by the time he got to the nearest logging camp, uh, he had frostbites that severe that he lost the foot and, uh, and the, uh, all the toes on the, on the other foot as well. He then enrolled into McGill's University. When he went home, by the way, his, his mother had died, and he got a legacy which, which put him through medical school. Um, he went to McGill University and then, uh, in Montreal, and then he um, took himself off to England uh, he worked his passage across, came to England and studied at the University College Hospital. Visiting France and German, he spoke French and German, told himself French and German so he could read the uh, philosophers in, in their own tongue. Um, and then he went back to, to, Cal to Canada and got married, had eight children, <laughs> and then worked his way up through um, being directors of asylums. So he'd actually switched across become very successful as an academic. His thesis was uh, very highly uh, regarded. And then he slowly worked his way up, working in asylums um, in London, Ontario, and right across Canada. He was considered extremely progressive for his day, believing in humane contact and normalization of routines within his institutions. And he encouraged organized sports and what would nowadays be called occupational therapy, but didn't exist in those days. He always had friends amongst the literati, those people who were lovers of literature and theatre, especially poetry. 
which he read deeply, and he memorized vast tracts of Yudhita, especially poetry, which he read deeply, and he memorized vast tracts of he could recite all of the leaves, of the, the leaves of grass, which is quite a vast poem. Okay. Um, met Walt Whitman in 1877 and produced um, a biography of the man. The thing which is important to us is that while he was 35 and in London, um, coming home one night from a poetry reading in a handsome cab, he had what was consider he considered to be a mystical uh, illumination. It so moved him, and we'll come across discussions about this in a moment, it so moved him that for the rest of his life he tried to work out what had happened, what was really going on when this was, from his psychological point of view, as well as from a mystical point of view, and literally what this meant a human being to have this oceanic feeling of being at one with everything. Okay? So, quite a guy. Mm -hmm. Quite a guy. He died, uh, again, after a night of um, meeting a uh, poetry reading with his friends. Um, they left. He uh, said to his wife he was going out on the veranda for a, a turn, a very cold night, and he slipped and banged his head and died literally in an accident a year before his book was published. So it's rather sad, he was uh, 64 when he died. So that's um, quite a life though, quite a life. <coughs> right, now, this bit is drawn from the, the uh, email that you might have already got. And uh, I see um, at least one person has printed out. So um, you can follow this with me. I'm just going to read the, the second part. Cosmic consciousness was drawn from an extraordinary experience he underwent at the age of 35. This proved so profound to him that he spent the remainder of his life studying the phenomenon, and hence with a more evidence-based attitude opened a new pathway to a more practical and scientific approach to the understanding of the mystical. Now, this is true. It is evidence-based. Nowadays, I think we'd say he is more anecdotal than he should be to be as proper scientific approach. He's bringing in opinion and he's bringing in um, ideas which at the time would have been considered valid, but nowadays would be argued and haggled about um, and nitpicked with. So in that sense, I'm not endorsing him for being a scientist, but rather for the broad sweep of his philosophy and the way he actually gathered things together and suggested and, and looked for sort of um, similarities in nature, etc., to try and explain what was going on with this particularly illuminated, this enlightenment experience, which he did, which he'd actually been through himself. So he's on the inside, if you like, looking back. Book presents cosmic consciousness, which was his term, as the third stage of a threefold evolutionary process, evolutionary process that the human race is going through. Uh, an evolutionary process of rising levels of awareness manifesting on the life forms of the planet, the third cosmic level occurring seldom but with steadily increasing frequency. Now what that meant was, what he saw when he looked back was an awful lot of people that had similar mystical, no sorry, not an awful lot of people, but a, a certain number of people that had mystical experience like he's talking about from a wide variety of backgrounds. He found it in literature, and he found it in history books, and what he was actually sort of struck by was the fact that this is something which is sort of emerging in the human race. There are fewer the further back we go, and there is, it's starting to it seem to him to be increasing with frequency. He still says, in one of the points I think we we'll read a bit later on, we're still talking about a small group of people, enough that we could be held within a large dining room. So we're not talking about a vast number, but in his, to his mind, it was increasing. And he goes through the sequences, and it was important to him. His scientific bent was that actually if you codify them and put them on a timeline, you see that they're getting more and more prevalent. Now, to be thoroughly scientific, you'd have to say, well, probably that's just because we're recording more of them. But the, the sweep that he gives it is that this is an evolutionary thing. This is a movement which is happening. And from his experience of it, it was a shift in consciousness. And that's an important sort of thing to place on it. 
what had changed was something had actually uplifted him in that experience, and when he looked back, other people had had this type of experience. Nowadays, we we have a bit more sort of uh, information and more and more um, research and literature about this, so we we can understand that what he was saying fits in very very clearly with other esoteric approaches to this type of uh, experience, particularly with the Zen thing. You know, what he's talking about in that would be a sartori, a little mm. ripple of this vast awareness, which is possible for human beings to reach. But he's not saying that you have to have a discipline and work towards it. He's not saying that in any sense that that, that, that actually helps. What he's saying is just look at the way it seems to be occurring. Okay? <clears throat> this cosmic level occurring seldom but with steadily increasing frequency. More and more of them as we get further and further on in history. Which includes, so he's talking about three levels of consciousness here. Simple consciousness of animals, awareness at the basest level of existence, and their interaction with their environment. So consciousness, first of all, is an interaction of animals with their environment. And it's really like a recording device. Information comes in and gets stored inside of them. So he's saying that uh, you have inert matter, then you have organisms, some of which are able to record their <laughs> environment. They're aware of what's going on around them. They interact with it in a way. The next stage up is what we would call, and that would do that with the, he, he, he first of all says that that's sort of what we find in the animal kingdom, this simple consciousness of animals. Then when you come to humans, you have a level of self-consciousness which occurs in human beings. And he, he, he's aware enough to notice that it's a social type phenomenon. It, it occurs, it's linked in with language, and it's linked in with interaction between people. But we're talking about the developed individual consciousness of, of humanity, an awareness of existence with purpose. The sense of a self as a center of that awareness and representing itself in forms such as art, literature, and music. And not all of us have it. <coughs> and it started to appear historically at a certain time in, 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 in the world in human beings. And what he's saying, it's an evolutionary thing. We become more and more aware, and we become more and more conscious in this self-conscious way. And it is something to be achieved. And we can see it coming through an individual human being's progress, from childhood through to adulthood. We can actually be aware of this, of this progress. And that's the second level of consciousness, which is a, a world worth attaining thing in a human being. And it's quite an achievement in itself. And it's a remarkable step beyond the simple consciousness that you find in animals. Okay? We'll, we'll, we'll come across more about this when, when we go on a bit. But he, I'm just laying down the, the, the groundwork as he does in the beginning of the book. And then above that is the cosmic consciousness, which is an awareness of the level of the divine, or the next stage of human evolution, incorporating all aspects of unity and love. He considered it to be a moral level of consciousness and that whereas people become aware of interaction at, at a love basis then this feedback between them is what is what it is this this cosmic consciousness breaking through or lifting them into that situation okay does that make sense as a as a broad sweep yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. right so on to your song sheets now <laughs> just to define them a little bit more um, the first paragraph and these are all quotes which are, are, are taken from this book this is the first time I think I've done a talk where all the quotes come from the one book um, and quite frankly there's so much in the book it's difficult to get it down into, into one talk um, I am recommending that you get it I think it's a book that you'll probably if you do buy, you'll keep <coughs> and you'll dip into it not because it's right, I disagree with him on so many points, but I'm really grateful for the fact that he, you know, he raises the argument in the first place. It's fascinating, it's a fascinating book. It's a fascinating book, yeah. yeah. And uh, you'll argue cases with him, you'll think, oh, that fellow hasn't got cosmic conscience, he, he's not talking. But the very fact that he brings them up and brings you into, it brings it into this argumentative sort of arena where you find yourself actually saying, well, uh, no, he is right. 
the, the, the use of language is different and it's it, and it's strange and it's not what you didn't actually think but and it's it, and it's strange and it's not what you didn't actually think but yes he's got a point in several cases and other ones where you think no I don't think that fellow's actually in the same league but this is the thing this is what he does and because he's, he's defining it he doesn't give it any religiosity yes he does talk about it that it is it's the, it's the same root in, uh, as religion and that these guys are the stars of religion and philosophy, etc. He's not hitting you overhead with it and say it's, it's not something that you have to do. It's something which is like a, an evolutionary process. You're in that stream. You're going in the same direction in your individual way. Um, you know, this is a description. He's putting it without any sort of sense of uh, um, religiosity. So uh, he's not pushing it in that way at all. Okay, so. Would anyone else like to read this? Yes. Please, John. <clears throat> One, simple consciousness, which is possessed by the upper half of the animal kingdom. By the means of this faculty, a dog or a horse is just as conscious of the things about him as a man is. <coughs> he is also conscious of his own limbs and body, and he knows that these are part of himself. Over and above this simple consciousness, which is possessed by man as well as man has another, which is possessed by man as well. Yeah, no, I don't really about that. Right. <laughs> Over and above this simple consciousness, which is possessed by man as well as man has another, which as is well man has another, which which is called subconsciousness. By virtue of this faculty, man is not only conscious of trees and rocks, waters his own limbs and body, but he becomes conscious of himself as a distinct entity apart from all the rest of the universe. It is as good as certain as no animal can realise himself in that way. Right. Now, you know, one, those of us here, I'm sure, would argue that the actual uh, final <coughs> statement, that's, I put that in, into um, their my italics because that is a point which I think we could argue, and that's one of the points I would like to take him up on. But as a general sweep of what he's saying, I, I'm, in, I'm in complete agreement with him. Um, I think I'm sure people like um, Rupert Sheldrake would argue that point as well about that sense of sense of self. But certainly, they can't express it in the in the same way as a human being could. And we are not in doubt with human beings when we interact with them, when we converse with them, whether they have a, a center of, of uh, awareness like that, in the same sense that, that we ourselves do. So, in that that sense, this is his basic laying down. Uh, and his description of what a simple consciousness would be like. And that we actually emerged from that as human beings. This is the sort of awareness that we had as children, very small children, and slowly we became self-aware. Slowly we formed an ego, if you like, a concept of ourselves, a story of ourselves, which we then started to use as a center from which we could examine and explore the world, from which we could understand the world in relationship to, us, to ourselves. And that story which we've travelled, the, the self story, the um, little autobiography, is what the Buddhists would call an ego. And that's a problem, really, in a certain sense. It isn't a problem at first. It's a problem if you haven't got one. Um, children without egos can be severe problems in, in institutions. That, you know, we, they, ha they have real difficulties in being socialised. So you have to give an egotistical centre, in a sense, to it to a child and to a developing person for them to have a reference point. But at, a, at another point, beyond that, that becomes a blockage to other forms of development, which is what he's actually saying here. But we have come through that level as individuals. Also, the whole race has come through that level. And he would say the whole evolution is pushing towards, through that level, towards something beyond. OK? You don't have to agree with it, but the idea is important because it, it sort of brings this whole thing into a, a different realm, a different mm -hmm. scale. Okay? Anybody with it on that? Mm -hmm. Okay? So you understand the sort of thing he's talking about and why it's different from animals to human beings. I think Jack London puts it in Call of the Wild. He said that he's talking about Book the dog and he <coughs> says, Book knew that he was hungry. But he didn't know that he knew that he was hungry. He just knew that he was hungry. Can you feel the difference there between a self-conscious being and an unself-conscious being? And that's why they have so, diffi so much difficulty in refusing food when it's on offer. 
you know. So horses will eat themselves to death. And um, the noble monkeys are terribly intelligent, but they cannot choose between, they cannot let go of food to pick up more food. They have to eat the food that they've got and lose the food that you're offering them. They've never yet got a bonobo to put this food down and grab the bigger piece of food. So they can't have deferred gratification. If you like. They can't risk this for that because this is in the hand. Now eat this or we lose that every time. <laughs> so that's the sort of thing that, that means they haven't got that reference point that says, hang on, if I drop this, I can grab that before they can get it away. They don't do that. But they are, apart from that, they are incredibly intelligent. Okay. Right. Next one. Would someone like to read the next one? Oh, oh. I haven't scrambled the typing. Shall I read the next one? Yes, please. This is further refined into four distinct stages of intellect. First, the perceptual mind. The mind made up of percepts or sense impressions. Brackets. A sound heard or an object seen. Close brackets. Second, the mind made up of recepts. Yeah, this is a, a new a word which was new to me, but it's one he uses a lot in his book. So presumably it was a current word that meant perceptions coming up and retained in some way inside a mind. Recept meaning the repeat. Yeah. He likened it, the next bit in the back bracket is actually the qualification of that. Uh, the mind of simple consciousness, brackets, he likens it to composite photography, building up percepts into a recept, various impressions built upon a unity, close brackets. Yep. Third, we have the mind made up of percepts, recepts, and concepts, brackets, where the being becomes conscious of itself as a knower and can name and communicate these constructed forms, close brackets. And fourth and last, we have the intuitional mind, the mind whose highest element is not a recept or a concept, but an intuition, sensation, simple consciousness, and self-consciousness are supplemented and crowned <coughs> with cosmic consciousness. Right. Well read, because I mean, what I've done that is, is that's his paragraph with other quotes from him in different places to try and illustrate what he's talking about. So that's, that's he's talking about sensation literally directly, information coming in, a sound heard or a picture seen, comes in and is, is, is somehow recorded inside something which we are calling a mind. But there's no separation between the thing which is recording it and the sensation pouring in in the first instance. Then from that simple consciousness begins to r recognize that information and act on it in some way. And then self-consciousness where it actually forms a center and can devise ways of using that information and can see, uh, seek out more and can communicate you know, between individuals, and then finally this one of intuition, where information is coming in from whatever, from the universe in some way, and is informing and supplementing that consciousness. Okay? Not, you don't have to agree with it, but do you understand the levels which he's trying to talk at? And I think what a lot of scientists would say, well, there's such a, a limited number of those people in the fourth level, it's not worth talking about. And what his, his point is, but it really is worth talking about, because this is what actually the level of people who are self-conscious are constantly breaking towards and constantly intuiting happening around them. So that it is the thing that moves art, it is the thing that moves music, it is the thing that moves all these different areas of human life. And it's bubbling on the surface of these people who are getting to the top of self-consciousness. They feel this as a sensation, they intuit it. They don't often know what it is, but they're striving for something. And he said, that's why it's important, which is a, an important point to get across. He agrees that there's very, very few people who actually achieve it. But that usually, in a, in a human life, some intimation of it will come through. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, now, from that, I'm going to move back.
back to the um, to the email again, if I may. Um, to the email again, if I may, and just uh, read through this part. <clears throat> this is his actual description, clear and formally, about what cosmic consciousness is about. He had his illumination, as I say, in a handsome cab. He was coming back from a poetry evening where he'd been with friends in London. Um, he's 35 years of age, and he lists these things as being very important because when he looked at the other incidences historically of um, cosmic consciousness, he didn't realize what it was that was causing it, so he, he tried to note down all the details that were similar. And um, those sort of things are quite important. He, he found it was usually in summertime where people had these experiences and usually it was um, in the 30s. Not necessarily, not rigidly so, but this is a sort of a fascinating thing which you would never actually considered thinking about, but being a recorder of information, he jotted this down and thought it might be quite significant. He also talks about himself in the third person, which is very strange for us nowadays. Uh, the writer, he calls himself, and he um, so it, 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 it might sound peculiar, but he's actually talking about himself here. The person suddenly, without warning, has a sense of being immersed in a flame or a rose-coloured cloud, or perhaps rather a sense that the mind is itself filled with a crowd of haze. At the same instant, he is, as it were, bathed in an emotion of joy, assurance, triumph, salvation. The last word is not strictly correct if taken in its ordinary sense, for the feeling, when fully developed, is not that a particular act of salvation is effective, but that no special salvation is needed. That's important. No special salvation is needed. The scheme upon which the world is being built is self-sufficient. It is this ecstasy far beyond any that belongs to the merely self-conscious life with which the poets, as such, especially occupy themselves. As, Gota as Gautama in his discourses preserved in the sutras, sutras he, he, he calls them, Jesus in the parables, Paul in the epistles, Dante at the end of the Purgatorio and in the beginning of the Paradiso, Shakespeare in the sonnets, Balzac in Serafito, Whitman in the leaves, Edward Carpenter in Towards Democracy, leaving to the singers the pleasures and the pains and the loves and hates and joys and sorrows, peace, war, life and death of self-conscious man. Though the poets may treat of these two, but from the new point of view, as expressed in the, the Leaves of Grass by Whitman, I will never again mention love or death inside a house. That is, from the old point of view, with the old connotation. Simultaneously or instantly, following the above sense and emotional experience, experiences, there comes to the person an intellectual illumination quite impossible to describe. Like a flash there is presented to his consciousness a clear conception, a vision, in outline of the meaning and drift of the universe. He does not come to believe merely, but he sees and knows that the cosmos, which to the self-conscious mind seems made up of dead matter, is in fact far otherwise is in very truth a living presence. He sees that instead of men being as they were patches of life scattered through an infinite sea of non-living substance, they are in reality specks of relative death in an infinite ocean of life. He sees that the life which is in man is eternal, as all life is eternal, and that the soul of man is as immortal as God is, that the universe is so built and ordered that without any peradventure all things work together for the good of each and all, that the foundation principle of the world is that is what we call love, and that happen the happiness of every individual is in the long run absolutely certain. The person who passes through experience will learn in a few minutes or even moments of its continuance uh, yes, sorry, of its continuance more than in months or years of study, and he will learn much that no study ever taught or could ever teach. Okay. That's quite a paragraph, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. <clears throat> Another strange thing, we've got to remember maybe the background that 
the book came from, but he'd had this experience and he talked to a lot of people, a lot of friends in the, in the medical profession, etc. And uh, he read a lot about it to try and understand what was happening to him, whether or not he was going mad. Because okay, this is what he was, he was actually involved in, was, uh, was psychology, the very early days of psychology, we're talking about 1860, 1870. So he was concerned that, too, that uh, a lot of people who had a similar experience might be um, diagnosed as being literally mad. So he's looking around for this. Um, I'm looking at the, the, the third paragraph here on, on the song sheet, Book disclosed in, in his book that his attempts to more fully understand his illumination experience of 1872, he was indebted to a certain CP. He doesn't really give him his, give his name throughout the book, but he, he actually says that this man was a lay preacher, a manual worker, um, who seemed to explain more of what was happening inside him than anybody else that he went to including Walt Whitman, who he met a bit later on. This chap was actually called Caleb Pink, and he was actually a lay preacher, and who he ascribed um, further understanding of his illumination. C.P. was a self-educated laboring man, never been to school, regarded by many who knew him as one who had a Christ-like presence and lived a very simple and honest life. Um, One of the things he says in the book is when he first met him, he was quite dismayed because this fellow uh, said that he um, didn't seem to believe in any sort of an afterlife or any sort of sense of eternity uh, of an individual self. But when we discussion with him, he said his attitude was almost like a Buddhist because what he considered was that um, the individual just dissolves into a sea of consciousness when mm. this individual life goes. So he doesn't actually believe in annihilation, other than the fact that it's dissolved, rather like the Buddhists do, you know, the, the dewdrop melts into the sea, so to speak, so it, it becomes uh, absorbed back into the consciousness. But his description of what was happening to Book was, clo was, was more helpful to him than anybody else, any, the, 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 anybody, than any other reference that he, could, he was given by any, any other form. And it's just worth so noticing that this was actually another very simple and direct chap. Remember, Book was self-educated, a lot of people I would think that he'd have come in contact in the Americas of that time would have been people who were self-educated sort of um, guys. There wasn't the, 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 the education system that, we, that we'd have had. And the level of, of manual work which was, would have been needed for a life on the frontier would have eschewed any sort of university study. But when it turned to it, he actually he took an academic life on board. Right. A quote now from the book. My copy only cost me a pound. They are doing them. This is the one I've got, which is a paperback. And I um, don't know how much they are now. A vast amount of sums. Actually, just. I don't this for eight pounds. Prices. Eight pounds. Yeah. There you go, you see. Any advances on it? They're all different <laughs> prices on the internet. Choose your, choose your price. Right, oh, that's good. Amazon yeah. have got uh, about 15 or 16 different prices. Marvellous. Yeah. 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 Used book. Yes. New or used. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, what I want to do now is just to. He's a very practical guy, and on page four, sorry, page three in the book, he addresses himself as to why he should write a book. Now, he, he says in other places that actually he wrote the book when trying to find out about it for himself. And the study that he did was literally for himself. But he decided to publish it. He, he expects his work, again he's talking to himself about himself in the third person, he expects his work to be useful in two ways. First, in broadening the general view of human life. He wants us to realize that this goal, if you like, which is hovering above us as human beings, as self-conscious human beings, is there. And it's pulling us towards it in some way. And that, it's that which gives a point to lots of the things that we are interested in, like music, like literature, like art, etc., which don't really have a practical s significance. They are, what, they are an ev evolutionary, it is an evolutionary pull towards the next stage, is what he's saying. Okay? 
in broadening the general view of human life by comprehending in our mental vision this important phase of okay? In broadening the general view of human life by comprehending in our mental vision this important phase of it, and by enabling us to realize in some measure the true status of certain men who down to the present are either exalted by the average self-conscious individual to the rank of gods, or adopting the other extreme are, in, are judged insane. So that's the first point. And the second point, in the second place, he hopes to furnish aid to his fellow men in a far more practical and important sense. The view he takes is that our descendants will sooner or later reach as a race the condition of cosmic consciousness. Just as long ago, our ancestors passed through simple and, so, and simple to self-consciousness. He believes that this step in evolution is even now being made all around us, and since it is clear to him both that men with the faculty in question are becoming more and more common, and also that as a race, we are approaching nearer and nearer to that stage of the self-conscious mind from which this transition of the cos to the conscious, cosmic conscious is effective. He realizes that granted the necessary heredity, any individual not already beyond the age um, which he, he limits as about 40 <laughs> may enter cosmic consciousness. He knows that intelligent contact with cosmic conscious minds assists self-conscious individuals in the ascent to the higher plane. This is the whole guru system, the, the, the priestly, the, the whole significance of things like monasteries and stuff, is that he considers for these conscious, more and more conscious people to lift those ones around because contact with the works and with other people of a, of a, of a slightly higher level lifts us all. It, it, this is a social phenomenon as well as an individual phenomenon. Because of our interaction, we become more and more sensitive, more and more aware of what's going on. I mean, we have to recognize that our egos are, are socially constructed. You know, a great deal of the information we have about ourselves is purely given to us by outsiders. That our sense of self, the story we write about ourselves inside, has been cribbed from literally the reactions of other people. That's the so. This is part and parcel of it. This is a lifting process in which human being, human interaction is raising us. Plus, he says it, uh, the, the thing which is constantly congruent with Eugene, he said it's totally bound up at the self-conscious level with language. The ability to reflect, the, the ability to put your concepts into words and to interact with other people refines you, refines the language, refines all that consciousness. And his diagrams for this, which we'll come to in, in a few minutes, are fascinating. Okay? Because what he's saying is that this, this, this consciousness is going out into the world and it's changing what it's seeing. It's coming back with more and more information and wherever it looks, it finds more information. It doesn't come across a dead end. It finds that not only do things get more complicated, but even the complications get complicated. And he, say, he describes it beautifully as the consciousness literally sticking to every surface and finding more surfaces inside every surface. So the consciousness is coming back and bringing back more and more awareness of what is the life out here. And the universe is becoming more and more alive as we get more and more involved with it. We know so many parts of it. And we're finding more and more parts within the parts that we found yesterday. So it is getting more and more complex. And that is making us more complex and our language more complex all the time. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Yeah? Okay. Right. So, <clears throat> that's his point about that. Let me just see the next quote which I've got from him. We didn't have any paper clips, so I have to resort to little tags like this. Please excuse me. He considered on evidence that there have been in the last 3,000 years of human history at least 14 undeniable cases of complete and permanent illumination. Okay? Now there's a bold statement. Okay. I'll read that again. He considered on the evidence that there have been in the last 3,000 years of human history at least 14 undeniable cases of complete and permanent illumination. And that in addition to them, there have been many other instances of partial, temporary, or doubtful illumination, several of which have occurred within the past century. Noting that the increasing frequency of the experience 
he deduced that very gradually and as it were sporadically and this is him talking about himself remember in the third person the human race is in the process of developing a new type of consciousness far in advance of the ordinary human self-consciousness which will eventually lift the race above and beyond all the fears ignorances brutalities and trivialities which beset it today hence the smile on brother's face He's above the fears, the ignorances, the brutalities, and the trivialities which beset it today. Okay? Mm. So, get rid of these as I go through them. Right. Now, paragraph four on the first page of the song sheet. <coughs> This living faculty about which he did directly perceived during his illumination, he's trying to get across to us here. This consciousness shows that the cosmos shows the cosmos to consist not of dead matter governed by unconscious, rigid and unintending law. By that he means unconscious law. The universe intends what it's doing. It's not doing this blindly, it's actually intending along uh, just like we do. Um, governed by unconscious, rigid, and un unintending law. It shows it, on the contrary, to be entirely immaterial, entirely spiritual, and entirely alive. It shows that death is an absurdity, that everyone and everything has eternal life already. You don't have to fight for it or earn it. It's yours. You just haven't realized it yet. It shows that the universe is God, and that God is the universe, and that no evil did or ever will enter into it. A great deal of this, of course, from the point of view of self-consciousness, is completely absurd. So he sees also that from our self-conscious point of view, this world is a hellhole full of knots, snags, brutalities, pains. So he ha he's holding both consciousnesses in his mind when he's talking like that. But the other one says it's complete. There is no problem in it. You know, it's that sort of Chinese thing that where we want to be, the enlightened state is only an inch away from where we are now. It's not, you don't have to do a great thing, it's, you shift the, it's a shift of consciousness. And in fact, there's a lot of uh, Buddhist thought, which is that you can't do it yourself. It's a gift, it is grace. It, it, it comes to you as it, you know, you didn't grow your own arms in the same, it wasn't an effort to grow your own arms or to grow your own legs or to develop. It happens, it's just the next stage and you step into it. I put here this, the, the note that Eugene was completely in agreement with, with what uh, Book was saying, but he said he'd limited it and that he didn't show the extent of what he was talking about, that this awareness that came in was much bigger than any sort of ordered cosmic sense. It was much more complete than that. And because of that, he'd limited the range of his study and he, it actually limited the nature of what cosmic consciousness was. In other words, it was a bad choice of words to describe something which was undescribable. Now, <clears throat> the next bit is, is really, um, I found interesting because without any religious aspect in it, he's trying to, he pulls religion into this area and he won't, he, he doesn't accept so to speak that they have the, the upper hand in, in any sort of description like this. And, uh, you have to, to remember that at the turn of the century, or as he's coming towards the turn of the century, the churches would have had an absolute control over this type of experience and this type of literature. And to, for someone to be speaking about religious experience in this way, albeit scientific, it was very, very dangerous to do. And even nowadays, I mean, this, this book is, is, is it's now considered to be a New Age type book. But there wasn't any sort of category for it to be in because it's not scientific. The scientists wouldn't go along with, you know, scientifically analysing the mystical experience up until a few years ago. And so it wasn't that. It's not a religious book. The religious people wouldn't have any, anything to do with it. So it, it's a, it, it's, it's, it's a non-subject, if you like. Um, but he, he very boldly tackles things. The next paragraph is, is really quite, quite fascinating. Would anybody else like to read? It's 
Man's progenitor was a creature. Man's progenitor was a creature, an animal, walking erect, but with simple consciousness merely. He was, as are today the animals, incapable of sin and equally incapable of shame, at least in the human sense. He had no knowledge or feeling of good and evil. He fell or rose into self-consciousness. His eyes were opened. He knew that he was naked. He acquired a sense of sin, became a sinner, and learned to do certain things in order to encompass certain ends. That is, he learned to labour. In still other words, the animal cannot stand outside itself and look at itself as any self-conscious creature can. Thank you. What he's doing there is the old wine in new bottles. He's telling the story of Genesis by making it a direct description of how human beings became conscious. Moving from animal conscious, in which they, you cannot sin, you cannot have shame, because you don't know yourself in any separable sense from what's going on. You're involved in everything you do, like the, the dog that doesn't know, it knows it's hungry, but it doesn't know that it knows it's hungry, so it can't respond in any way. It doesn't have an awareness of itself to feel shame in or sin about any of its actions. It reacts to the environment rather than that it actually forms from a unified center a mode of action. Once it steps into that consciousness, then sin can step in because you can get this thing of doing the wrong thing. Whether the wrong thing is the inefficient thing or the thing that gets itself into trouble or the thing that gets it into, into trouble with the herd. So it's the social constraints can be put upon it and then you get things like shame and sin entering into the situation. <coughs> so the old wine in new bottles which, it, which is being pur purveyed here is that this is the story of Genesis told from the point of view of an evolutionary statement of human beings moving from animals that just react to their environment into human beings who respond to the environment and then have a level of choice in that reaction. So it's then because we have a level of choice involved in it that we can sin and we can be ashamed of what we've done because we are the progenitors of it. We are the ones who have actually given ourselves to that. We have self-awareness. Does that make sense? So he's retelling the, the religious story there and describing it purely and simply um, in that way. I remember talking with a, with a boy, he's now a boy who does our computers actually, when, when we were at school and he said to me, you don't actually believe in, in Adam and Eve, do you, sir? And I said, how do you mean? He said, well, the idea that, that there was the first man and the first woman. And I said, well, you mean the word for the first one? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, no, they were apes. And I said, well, yeah, but so when did they become men? And he said, well, they slowly changed. I said, but there must have been a first one. <laughs> and I said, what about the first one that realizes that it's an ape? <laughs> and we, we talked about this really quite well. We were talking about it over lunch. And I mean, um, it wasn't a scripture class or anything like that. So we didn't, neither of us had to, had to get, get a point across in that sense. But. People actually, I think I can say this, but yeah, but there must have been a time when the first one said, wow, look, um, what hairy hands I've got, you know, or if I, you know, pick this stone up and shape it a little bit more, it'll, it'll cut more meat. This sort of level, you know, and, well, look at me, I'm doing this, and they've got big clumsy ones over there, you know. You've got this interact. There must have been a first level when we started to do that. And when you write about that symbolically, then in Genesis, then you talk about this coming, you know, the first man and the first woman. They knew that it wasn't complete because when they had children, the children went off and, and got wives. So they weren't, they, weren't, they weren't talking about it as a, a creational thing. God only made this little family. They're talking about the first ones who would call themselves human beings. In other words, the first conscious ones. And they're, they're placing it historically around four or 5,000 years ago, which is... When human beings started to record in literature, uh, in writing, self-conscious experiences. Now we've been producing artifacts for about 12, 15,000 years. 
but you, you could sort of say to yourself, yes, they're moving towards self-consciousness, but we're talking about an axe head, we're talking about a spear handle, we're talking about things which have been decorated. When the, the, the anthropologist would say, if it's just an axe head, then it's just a utilitarian thing, but when they start to put marks on them, which are unpractical, they don't actually do anything, they've obviously made it their own. Because, you know, mine's got a little picture of a Venus on it. And mine's got, oh, mine's got a football team on one. I've got Chelsea written on mine. <laughs> so they're personalising these things. Then you, you can see that there's an individual involvement with this thing. Then you've got the sense of self-consciousness in whether they were apes, whatever they were, they were like us because they were conscious of themselves. And that would get more and more refined. As more and more of them in the tribe got it, then you could have discussion and argument. Um, and then you've got intentionality becoming more and more refined to the great sophistical, sophisticated levels that we've got now. We can watch Carnation Street, or we can watch America's Got Talent, or whatever. The choice is endless. When you think about the amount of interaction, though, uh, human interaction to actually get these things, get, get a TV station going, get all those sort of information out, the vast level of complexity that there is just to watch a simple TV program is stunning, phenomenal. And that that should come out of creatures that could gather bananas and just about run on their hind legs for small periods of time. It, it's absolutely amazing. There is something pushing through, going for more and more sophistication, more and more complexity. And you have to see that in the way that religious figures like um, Gautama the Buddha, the Buddha um, Muhammad, Jesus. So he's linking in from these people who have got vast religions formed around them with characters like Socrates, um, Plotinus, Roger Bacon, Dante. He's pulling them into situations and describing, saying that these point people are all talking about the same experience. Um, some people have been elevated to the level of gods because of the way they described it by other people around them. Others have been kept as individuals, as <coughs> philosophers, etc. But he's saying it's the same experience. Um, and I think in that sense we have to, to give Book a pretty good pat on the back because he was one of the first to actually say this. And the first to name names and say, look, I think this guy is. And in many senses, I think he's putting them forward as let's argue about this one, you know, because the language is, is obscure and the information is obscure, but it's worth talking about. And I think most of the ones are the ones that, that we would have discussed at some time with, with Eugene, which would have come up in, in certainly St. John of the Cross. That's John Yepes, the, um, the nerd, number 14. Um, Francis Bacon's a weird one for us to do because. Of course, the book is a Baconite, so he believes that Francis Bacon wrote Shakespeare's sonnet, so he's in there rooting for this guy, Francis Bacon, who was a, a brilliant man, um, member of the government, etc., and quite a character, but um, I've ne never been convinced that he wrote Shakespeare's plays at all, and it's unnecessary to even say it. But Jacob Bohm is in there, um, spelled differently, number yes, 17. Um, Spinoza, Eugene used to talk a lot about was Swedenberg. Uh, Blake. So, Balzac, new to me, I, I've not read any Balzac at all, so that's new to me. Whitman, is certainly his poetry is very moving, um, and it does certainly have this wonderful interaction with, with nature. It's, uh, it's, it's very powerful stuff, but I wouldn't have considered him in that light until the way the book describes him, and of course he knew the man personally, had treated him as a doctor, so he knew him well. Um, so that interaction... Is, is worth is worth looking at in the book. So that's just the sort of that's the great thrust of his of his argument. Now there are a few points now which I'd like to go through. It's quarter to nine. What I'm minded of at this point is to say that what the book is talking about here is a is a thing which is symbolically seen as the lotus, the jewel in the lotus, which the Buddhists talk about. Um, which pulls that process. You could say, well, yes, it's pushing up. You could also say, it's like, it's like the old thing that Goethe said, there is a force of gravity, yeah? And stones obey the force of gravity, yeah? But then there must also be a force of levity, 
because plants grind this, take the ground up stones with a little bit of water and then lift themselves out of the ground and point at the sun. So if there's a force of gravity, there's a damn force of levity too. Because these living things are trying to get away from the earth quite powerfully and they're pulled into these shapes. They're pulled into this. And how the hell, and I wondered this as a child, how the hell do you get a pink flower from a dirty brown black piece of soil? What is there inside that root that can sort out the chemistry to make that beautiful turquoise, orange, white? How does it get a pure white flower out of the filth that it's sitting in? Metals. Metals? Source them through? Different. Yeah. Different metals. It'd be damn difficult to do that, wouldn't it? The chemistry which is going on in there is incredible, mm -hmm. isn't it? Well, the chemistry is complicated, yeah. Very complicated. <laughs> and it's just a root. <laughs> So it is, it's incredible. And you'd have to say <coughs> that there's something in here which seems to be pulling or synthesizing those processes into this unity there. That's the symbol anyway, and that's the, that's the, the thing which is, is, if you like, I think is being formed here by, by, by Bo. He mentions the, the jewel in the lotus as being one of the uh, concepts of, of, of Buddha. Now, I don't think he had the the literature at his disposal and the translations that we have in that sense. Um, and this next bit I think could be would be argued nowadays because he's talking about philology and it's a far more refined subject now. But if we just look at um, paragraph six, would anyone like to read paragraph six? Language is the objective of which self consciousness is the subjective. Self consciousness and language, two in one, for they are two halves of the same thing, are the sine qua non of human social life, of manners, of institutions, of industries of all kinds, of all arts useful and fine. No word can come into being except as the expression of a concept, neither can a new concept be formed without the formation, at the same time, of the new word which is its expression. Not only does language fit the intellect, covering it in every part, following all its turnings and windings, but it fits it also in the sense of not going beyond it. For Bucha, conceptualizing for a being is a double process, constructing the thought form while simultaneously symbolizing symbolizing it, naming it so as to represent it to itself. Right, okay. Well read, because it's quite a complicated thing. No word can come into being except as the expression of a concept. Neither can a new concept be formed without the formation at the same time of a new word, which is its expression. Now, modern philosophy has argued this point backwards and forwards. So we did at one time <coughs> get to a, to a state where language governed virtually all philosophical thought, the nature of words, um, and what you could actually say, what is possible to say in language, became the whole thrust of philosophy. It's moving away from that now. But with people such as Gilbert Ryle and Wittgenstein, the very nature of language, the analysis of language, was the analysis of the world. The two things were totally synonymous. And what they would probably say here is, is that we can't really know, we can't really understand this <coughs> completely because we can't talk about concepts unless we use language. We really are, are limited because that's the, the element with which we use for discussion, to pass information backwards and forwards. So to separate ideas, concepts from, from words is extremely difficult. I think we can think of situations and we can put ourselves into situations where we seem to be communicating without, without language, but as soon as you come to try and think it and form it, you step right back into language again and then the laws of language govern it. So whether the universe is logical or not, philosophers could say, well, we don't know. What we know is the human mind is logical and everywhere it looks it sees logic. That is the nature of the thing. You can't put the glasses down. You have to look through these glasses of your mind to see the universe. So the two things will always appear to be synonymous. They'll always appear to be completely together. 
you can't step out of your mind and look at what's got actually going on. You're always inside it. So that process, is, you're actually landlocked into writing them from the, from the word dot. But what he goes on to say, and the, the, some of the passages which we're, we're now going to have a look at, are fascinating in the senses that where we see human beings developing in an area, we see that language immediately develops with them and becomes complex and reflects what we consider to be the mind. It is the mind insofar as we cannot separate the two out. Whether he's right, and he's saying that the, the evolution that happens together, the concepts and language form, what he's saying is that we are social beings and that to interact is to form our minds. And that we need that interaction, we need that formulation and communication with ourselves as much as with anybody else to form the concepts that we have. It's an internal story that we're telling. And it binds the world as fixedly in, as, it, as it binds our perception of the world. Does that make sense to you? That you can't really step outside of your own looking glass. And your looking glass, in this case, is your mind. Isn't this different from experiencing something else? When you experience something, you don't necessarily put words to it, because then you're talking about it, which has to be retrospective, doesn't it? If you want to put words to it, you're into the realm of, of memory. Here we are in a situation which the philosophers have argued backwards and forwards about. Yeah. And I, I see it that way. I see, see the perceptual thing, as Book is talking about, but most, um, I would say, scientists working on the brain now would say no. Even to separate the information that's coming through your eyes into visual forms, your mind is backfeeding into the eyeballs. Yeah. So that, I mean, they do these incredible experiments where they, they make you look at the world through a prism. And... Um, Within a matter of hours, you've turned the image upside down. Yes. They give you an upside down image, and your mm -hmm. brain turns. Your brain turns and corrects it within hours. Mm -hmm. So that within a day, you can put these glasses on where the world is upside down and ride a bike. It, you know, people can do. So what we're, they're saying is that we're interacting even with the way we see. The the information that's coming at us when we try and get get robots to see the world, we can't get them to focus enough on what's important. Because there's so much stimulus coming at you. So we as human beings have already sifted most of the stuff that's coming at us, even before we see people. And there's supposed to be now sort of milliseconds of delay before what you see here is registered in the brain, during which it sifts itself through. And it forms what you're allowed to see. And that's based on what you've seen previously. So that when you, we show things like photographs to... Uh, Aborigines that have never seen a photograph or a picture before, they don't see it as anything other than a piece of paper. They don't see it as a picture of somebody. Okay? So in that sense, that is a point to be argued, uh, which I don't, want to, I don't wish to go into it now, because there's a, very, there's a lot of arguments about it, and both of them are very valid. That's why I would say, don't think for one minute the book is a scientific writer nowadays. I think he was when he wrote at the turn of the century. What I said was, the broad sweep of what he says, I think, is important. The actual detail of what he's saying could be argued. But the very fact that he brings this, an arena for argument is fascinating. And that arena of perception and memory is a very important one, too. You know, we just, um, as a child, you, as a baby, if you've ever had a, a fairly newborn baby, you'll know that they don't recognize his image in the, images in the world uh, as we do. It takes a long time before they start to even track a moving object. And you know, then they start to form different sort of recognition. You can see them starting to see similars mm -hmm. and recognize things and reach for things, you know, recognize things and reach for things, you know. Eugenius is talking about the fact that a baby will reach for the moon. It's no idea just how far away it is. That is something which we have to learn, to separate our field of vision into distance as well. And that takes time. And these are all things which are forming very rapidly. A copy of uh, College of Cosmic Consciousness published in 1960, a nice hardback copy. And it was worth noticing just, it's, it's one of the, um, by the original printers, Dutton's, uh, the publishers, Dutton's, and it's um, got a list of the, the reprints, and it's been reprinted virtually every three or four years since 1901. 
So it's been constantly in print, in uh, out there. So it's a very influential book. Um, and I think it is, most people would say nowadays, you wouldn't class it as a scientific book. Although, for 1901, he is bringing science to the subject, organizing it and order, ordering it in a completely, in a, an almost sort of um, biological way. You see, see, he's following sort of a genus of this particular type of uh, thought form, this consciousness, and he's sorting it out in, in, a, in a very deliberate sense. Um, the uh, things he accepts, accepts as evidence nowadays, we, we, we require a great deal of qualification in. But that broad sweep is really quite quite something. And I'd like to draw your attention to the, on the song sheet, page three, which is you have to turn sideways, unless you've got a very strange <coughs> ocular arrangement. And um, if I may, I'm sorry that this, the print is small. Um, I should have been able to get it larger than this, but I haven't. And he's talking about cosmic consciousness here, and he's talking about the way it has been described and named, which to me is, is this is what allows so many of those characters that we've seen as being um, experiences of uh, illumination in through this door, because of course some of them are actually talking of a dual personality, particularly Shakespeare in the sonnets. He's writing his poems to somebody. Now, most people consider, and this is part of the big controversy about Shakespeare, as to whether it was to a gay man, or whether it's to a woman, or whether it's to a companion, or whether it's to a patron. Well, the book says, well, if you say he's actually talking to himself, and it's either his ego talking to his cosmic conscious self, or his cosmic conscious self talking to his ego, you have a different concept of what's going on. And when you consider that the sonnets are thought to have been written over a period of about 20 years, it's more consistent that it would be like that. Rather like um, the Rubaiyat, which is, sounds like he's, he's chatting up a lady, could actually be talking to a spirit, in the Jungian sense of talking to the other half, which balances his, his, uh, his whole psyche, the animus and the anima. If you, if you read the Rubaiyat, you... And the Sufis are often referred to the beloved as being the other, the enlightened self, and they call upon it to come and join them. Yeah. Um, a loaf of bread, a jug of wine, and be beside me in the wilderness, beloved. That mm. sort of thing, which can sound like a picnic, but it can also sound like um, it's an invitation. invitation. It is an invitation, absolutely. Yeah. It is. Right. So, page three on its side. The faculty itself has many names, but they have not been understood or recognized. It would be well to give some of them here. They will be better understood as we advance. Either Gautama himself, or someone of his early disciples, called it Nirvana, because of the exti extinction of certain lower mental faculties, such as the sense of sin, the fear of death, desire of wealth, etc., which is directly incident upon its birth. This subjugation, excuse me, I have problems reading this as well. This subjugation of the old personality, along with the birth of the new, is in fact almost equivalent to the annihilation of the old and the creation of a new self. I have a friend who some of you may have come across actually called Tony Peak, whose, whose theme in life is to actually constantly talk about a daemon that we have inside of ourselves, a higher self, which enters into our situations often with information that we, we cannot possibly know and helps us sort our life out. If you could see that in the same context of what Brooke is talking about here, that would be the level of self-consciousness which is starting to pick up information that's coming in from this highest level of consciousness, which appears to us like a separate self, because it's coming in with information that we don't know where the source is coming from. Okay? The word nirvana is defined as the state at which the Buddhist saint is to, uh, is to uh, acquire as the highest aim <coughs> and highest good. Jesus called the new condition the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven. 
because of the peace and the happiness which belong to it and which are perhaps its most characteristic features. Paul called it Christ. He speaks of himself as a man in Christ, of them that are in Christ. He also calls it the Spirit and the Spirit of God. Spirit is an old word for consciousness. Now Eugene used to use the word spirit often. And it wasn't until I realized that he meant it in the context of consciousness, that essence which is there, which is like a flavor in the background constantly supporting, that's how he meant it. The spirit moves. When he said spirit moves, consciousness moves. It's a catalyst. It makes things happen. It pulls <coughs> things together. It draws things into situations which are not there, you know, in the in the material situation, but it organizes them into geometrical, logical structures which are far more complex than than you could possibly imagine coming from that material situation. Um, Tolly talks about flowers and diamonds being sort of a synthesis of, of, of materials <coughs> which outshine the material that they come from. They, ha they have uh, such an essence to them that uh, they are beyond the chemistry. They seem to, to act beyond the chemistry that constructs them. And uh, in that sense, this is well, how the, the meaning of the word spirit. It's a distillation of matter. As I know. <coughs> um, Jesus, oh sorry, um, Spirit of God. And Paul, after Paul had entered cosmic consciousness, he knew that Jesus had possessed the cosmic sense and that he was living, as it were, the life of Jesus and that another individuality, another self, lived in him. The second self he called Christ, the divinely sent deliverer. Identifying it not so much with the man, Jesus, as with the deliverer which was to be sent, and which had been sent in his person, who was both Jesus, the ordinary self-conscious man, and Messiah, the herald and the exemplar of the new higher race. This duplex personality of men having cosmic consciousness will appear many times as we proceed and will be seen to be consistent and, and prominent, probably a constant and prominent phenomenon. Thank you, prompt. <laughs> Mohammed called the cosmic sense Gabriel and seems to have looked upon it as a definitely separate person who lived in him and spoke to him. Dante called it Beatrice, making happy, a name almost and quite equivalent to kingdom of heaven. Balzac called a new man a specialist and a new condition specialism. Whitman called, co Whitman called cosmic consciousness my soul and spoke of it as if it were another person's. Okay? I don't wish to go any further in that, but if you see the way book does, that this translation of the different words to cover the same meaning, so that Tolly sort of says, well, if you see that when Jesus talks about spirit, he's talking about the same thing that the Buddha means when he says emptiness. Spirit. He's talking about the same thing that the Buddha means when he says emptiness. Because they're referring to something which hasn't got a word. That is an extremely elusive thing to describe. But it is empty. It's got no things in it. It's the stuff behind all the things. And it's the essence, if you like. It's the spirit. It's that distillation of matter, which is beyond matter, and which hasn't got a form. So it's got no quality you can describe. How the hell can you depict it? But you know it's there. And that knowing is, of course, the cosmic consciousness. Right. So... <clears throat> what we finished up saying just before the break <clears throat> is that language and consciousness, the book is saying, go hand in glove. They, you cannot separate the two. They're the two sides of the same coin. They're the same quality. And to, to actually make reference to that, he points at the way language develops wherever you take it. So if you go into an area, you become amazed at the complexity of that area, whatever it is, and the language develops alongside it. And he gives a, um, an instance of it, which is on page four, and page four, and again on page six. But if you just read four, I put this in because there are quite a lot of people here who are interested in poetry and wordplay, and I thought just that you would just find this charming. Um, would anyone like to, look at, to like to read this bit? Mm -hmm. Bear in mind, it is a somewhat of a poison chalice, and you'll see why. 
<laughs> Any brave souls amongst us? Yeah. You'll do it? Have a go, John. Thank you. It's just above that. Okay, the whole thing, sorry, if you start as word of literary language. Good luck. <laughs> Where the literary language speaks of the young, of all sorts of animals, farmers, shepherds and sportsmen, it would be a shame to use so general a term. The idiom of nomada, as nomads, Grimm, sorry. nomads, sorry, as Grimm says, contain an abundant wealth of manifold expressions for sword and weapons, and for the different stages in the life of cattle. In a more highly cultivated language, these expressions become burdensome and superfluous. But in a peasant's mouth, the bearing, carving, hauling, and killing of almost every animal has its own peculiar term, as the sportsman delights in calling the gate and members of game by different names. Thus, Dame Juliana Berners, Lady Prioress of the nunnery of Sockwell in the 15th century, the reputed author of the Book of St. Albans <laughs> informs us that we must not use names of multitudes promiscuously, that we are to say a congregation of people, a host of men, a fellowship, a fellowshipping <laughs> of women, <laughs> and a, a bevy of ladies. We must speak of a herd of hearts, hearts, swan, hearty swannies, crannies, Cranes, I think that is. Hearts, hearts mm -hmm. swans, cranes, or wrens. A siege of herons, or bite to. Bitterns, I think. I think it's a bittern, but a muster of peacockies. A muster of peacockies. A watch of nighting gales. A flight of doves. A clattering of chuffs. A pride of lions. A sleuth of birds. <laughs> Birds, yeah. <laughs> a gaggle of gays, geese, yes. a skulk of foxes, a soul of fe friars, I think it is, friars, a, pontif a pontificalate of prelates, an <laughs> abominable sight of monks, a drunken ship of cobblers, <laughs> 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 and some of other human and brute assemblages. In like manner, in dividing game for the table, the animals were not carved, but a deer was broken, a goose reared, a chicken frushed, a coney unlaid, a crane displayed, a curlew unjointed, a quail winged, a swan lifed, lift, a lamb shouldered, a, a heron dismembered, a peacock disfigured, <laughs> a salmon chuddied, a haddock suddied, <laughs> and a soul loined, and a brem splayed. I'm so glad you read that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you read it. It's mass slaughter. Yeah, just the way, I mean, from the fact that my god, what they used to eat in them, <laughs> just by anything that crawled or flew. Um, the whole point of this is that language is extremely <laughs> sensitive and of course it goes wherever you take your mind. It is, in fact, as many philosophers have argued, the only representative of mind that we have. So when we're talking about mind, we're talking about language. And when we're talking about the concepts of touch, we're talking about the language which we handle them in. So that's an area which I, I wouldn't want to go into, but which for modern uh, levels of philo philology would go into that and would say, well, you, you can't really talk about what they knew. All you can talk about is what they wrote down. So we mustn't really get into the realms of subjective which, which he is getting into. But he has gone into them, and not only has he gone into them, he becomes really fascinated. If you turn now to six... It gives a totally different flavour. It does. Yes. It does. And of course... It's much more interesting. Yeah. And the, this is the thing which we've said about Shakespeare as well. When you see them written down like that, this is because before printers there was no formulated spelling. So when we actually talk about children now who haven't learned to spell, we're talking about a, a, a printing skill that was done purely when people started to mass produce books. Before then, if it looked right and you could get the sounding of it, it was right, it was a word. So that they would often change the spelling of their own names if they felt, you know, they wanted to make it 
sound a bit more like this or a little bit like that. So you get Smith become Smythe and all this sort of stuff to give it an individual flavor. You could spell, you could use language in your way. It was a creative act the way you spelt. It became officially recognized and systemized by printers, not by um, artists or literary people. And Shakespeare bent words backwards and forwards. As far as we know from the handwritten stuff he did, which is mostly bills of lading and um, court proceedings at his own signature, he spelled his own name four or five different ways. I think it's more than that, it's about eight different ways. So um, before we get, when you're talking to people about spelling and stuff, you recognize that it, it was in fact a creative art at one time. And as you've just seen, you have to then formulate just how you're going to say this word. So um, of course, when books became mass produced, we couldn't handle that, and it started to become more and more refined. But here's an interesting aspect of what he's pointing out here. This is a very important term of Eugene's work, because Eugene was very concerned that we do dictionary work, that we realized that the universe was unity, and that the differentiation of the, of the unity of the universe is echoed in the differentiation of language. And that the whole point about the story of Babel, etc., is that the tongue becomes convoluted and confused in us, and we don't know what we mean. Mm. Now, the more you analyze language, you subsume topics under headings, and the headings become more and more simple. And in language, you look for the roots of the word, and you get the meaning. You get the meaning of the roots, and your concepts become simplified in terms of their meaning. They start to become tools with engineering type descriptions. They no longer become flavors and nuances, but they become gathered and subsumed under headings, and you get less and less headings. And you do that by analyzing the language. So you're, you get more, more complete ideas, but less of them. And that's the way to understand the multiplexity of the universe, to pull it back to unity by mm -hmm. analyzing the nature of the language. Now what you've got here, the book is talking about going from left to right into complexity. But of course you can then go back the other way and go back towards unity, towards a synthesis of language. And it helps you to understand. I'm, I'm not going to, this is, this is for your uh, pleasure and enjoyment if you take the, the song sheets home with you and have a look at them. But, I mean, it, I just find it fascinating to look at the very bottom one, where it takes you through the Latin and through the, through the Greek. So you get from the word um, Skeptomai, I look, and you trace it across into the words that, that the English words that it actually appears in as the word spect or pect. You get it in um, expect, specimen, expect, um, if you take those, and any one of those, if you take it across, you get from that expecting, expected, expected, unexpected, expectable, um, expect, specimen, expect. Um, if you take those, and any one of those, if you take it across, you get from that expecting, expected, expected, unexpected, expectable. So you're getting a whole nature, family of words, if you like, coming from descending from one from one, one or two parents. So you can then limit, you can actually reduce your vocabulary to small syllables with meaning. And then when you're given the word, you can analyze it in terms of the general meanings and put it back into its family roots back into the languages it probably came from, which in, in English would probably go back through Latin, um, whether through the German root or through the uh, Romance languages root, into Latin and Greek. Then to Sanskrit if you wanted to. And you're then reducing the number of ideas you have which control the world. Your language controls your world for you, and you're simplifying your understanding of the world. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm. Okay. Now, book, Brooke's not talking about that. He's going the other way. He's showing you just how fascinating it is the way the language breaks to actually accommodate and to wrap itself around the things that, that we find in the world as soon as we look. These things were always there, but not to consciousness. And as your <coughs> consciousness goes into them, it discovers these things, wraps around them, and ties them up with a word. You need to know that. 
to understand how you're thinking and how you're functioning in the world. And it helps you more and more to analyze your words, to know what you mean. Because we all word, use words which he would say passively. We use them because we've heard them in that situation, but we don't actually know what they mean. And I know that because I've used words and been caught out because I've used the word not knowing what it meant. I used the word hi hiatus because I'd heard it used and I thought it meant an argument, a big, a big kerfuffle. And I was, I was brought out no in certain terms when I actually had to find out, go back to a dictionary and look what the damn thing really meant, you know? And we all do this <laughs> in all areas because we pick up words from each other and we mean? use them and the, it means a gap. A gap? Yeah, a space between. <coughs> and um, an area. Yeah, is a gap in the intestine, maybe just between the, the level of the... Did you think it was an argument in the intestine? Yes. There'd been a hiatus at school, and I didn't realise what that meant. I thought, oh, I wonder who was hitting who. Um, and it was not the no thing. And so that process is extremely good for us. And if we actually trace the root back as to where it comes from, you know, and we know from that word it must be Latin because of the ending, you can pretty well understand where that would come into other sections, which is what the book is talking about here, but in the opposite way. So he's saying that in your mind, you, you understand your mind most concretely with the words that you know. And this is, we used to constantly come up against this in, in, in school because the thing which you're measuring all the time in any exam you do is use of language. So if you get kids very good with words, they will do very good in all their exams, even if they don't really study biology very well. They'll write a good essay. They'll bend it around. They'll look at what the word. They'll know what the words are. <coughs> and they'll, even if they haven't studied the information, they'll be able to write a pretty damn good essay. And you, wherever you look at this, intelligence seems to correlate with reading and language skills. Yeah? So, I mean, when I was at the university, we used to have a, a drama group. And they were, we didn't teach drama at the university. We were always asked to put displays on and things. We used to put displays on for the governors, but we didn't teach drama at Liverpool University. It was an extracurricular activity. But the guy that ran the drama society, when he was asked for why he, was, he should get so much funding, he pointed to the fact that the number of kids that had been through the students, sorry, not kids, the number of students that had been through the drama group were getting interviews and were, were, were um, successful at interviews at a much higher rate, something like about five times as successful as the, as the other ones, the, other, the, uh, the test group that hadn't. They were actors. They were used to putting themselves across. They went into situations ready to talk, to, you know, probably to embroider situations, mm -hmm. we might say, which is the element of, you know, we don't talk about it in interviews, but it's true. And these fellows were pretty well successful, and the university constantly funded it because they recognised that this was a very valuable tool. And it was important for people to have those language skills. So look at that yourself. Eugene, constantly sort of use a dictionary. Get yourself a good etymological dictionary, and if you come across a word, you, they'll start to niggle at you. Literally, by listening to us and reading Shakespeare, words will start to niggle at you, and like that group of words there, you think, I wonder what it actually means. You know, and look it up and find out where it came from, how they first used it. The OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, will tell you the first instance that that word was used in print. You can go right back to the first time it was used, and you realize that words like conscience didn't mean the same thing it does now as it did then. And some words have got completely the opposite meaning that they had when they were first used. Mm -hmm. And you can see why it turned and why it changed. So, going along with book. Eugene's understanding of this would come on top of that and parallel to it as well. So you're actually seeing the way that this, your mind works in the world because you have a different vocabulary to me and you have a different meanings to your vocabulary and some of yours are passive and some of mine are passive and some of mine are active. In other words, I know what the word means and I can use it confidently. You know, the problem is that we use words and the person on the other side doesn't have the same meaning. So Eugene would always start a lecture by defining his terms. Defining the term of the word, not the world. So when we're talking about love, we're not talking about real love out there in the world, whatever it might be. We're talking about what I mean by the word, what you mean by the word, so that we're not arguing at cross purposes. You know? You might be talking about the love of your life, I could be talking about Guinness. 
<laughs> because in English you can say you're looking both. Yeah. The same thing. <laughs> yeah. In English we only have the one word for the both two experiences. Now in Greek they have four. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a different thing altogether. And we use their words when we, when we talk about pornography and things like that. We use their words for a level of love which is quite distinct from any other level. It's to do with literally... But we haven't got that in English. You know, we have the one word that we use in all this, so we, we have to borrow from other languages, which we've done constantly to refine our language. You know, so we can talk about agape as well, which is the other form of love which we haven't got a word for either. You know, which we tend to talk about platonic. But, um, we have a platonic, platonic relationship. You know, which is they would, they would use the word agape. We haven't got a word for that. We know it means love, but what kind of love does it mean? Mm. Plato didn't mean it the way we use it. Said you subsume it, you put them under the say, under, te under headings, like he's doing. If you turn that diagram like that, what you've got is a family tree. Yes. Okay? Mm. So you can trace the parents if you like, you can trace the root of any meaning of those words. Yes. Back, usually, um, we say, and he don't, the Greeks had a word for it, we tend to go backwards and use the root languages, yeah. uh, even nowadays, because that's the basics, the bedrock of our language anyway. So we, de we develop it from it in that way. If you're going back like that, you're actually simplifying your view of the universe, because you're talking to it about, basically, if you take that one, Skeptomai, I look in Greek, then you're actually talking about the looking process, which is relevant to all those children, words there, and the offspring that they have as well. So if you know that that word, yes. that, that skeptic, becomes spect in English, yeah. then you can trace that root back. Yeah. And what that does to your head is it crunches numbers together. Yeah. And instead of many ideas, you start to have fewer ideas that cover yes. more of the universe. Nailing the meanings down, we start to order ourselves at, at that particular level. Yeah. And this process provides our order. Yeah. And what Book is talking about is that that is how human consciousness has developed, by going into situations and finding differentiation constantly, and naming it, and that symbolizing it, and that makes it, makes it real to consciousness. Mm -hmm. It was always there. We do. And then he takes this dramatically, which we're going to go on to the next thing, which is really quite important, which is that, <coughs> bringing back to this next level, he's going to say not only that consciousness develops, but look at other things which also seem to develop. Now, this is where the science of this we have to take as being very iffy. But let's look at what he calls it. This, is, this would be anecdotal evidence. In history, you can accept anecdotes. Anecdotes are stories. If enough people said that um, William the Conqueror actually lost the battle of Hastings, we'd have to believe them. We'd have to believe them. There's no way you could scientifically dig it up again, and run the battle and say, no, he always wins. <laughs> so history is based purely on, on stories. If enough people wrote about it, then it's true in history, but only in history. In science it's a different, you know, in biology and chemistry it's a different level of, um, a different type of truth verification that we have. This is, subjects are all different. So the chemistry has a different verification than physics, and physics has a different verification than biology, and history has a different um, type of verification, and geography has a different type of verification. That's how we understand the different subjects. Um, and Although is it that in, in the sciences things have to be repeatable, whereas in history yeah. everything is a one-off one event? Yes, and so we, we have to look at a different level of validity that, that's likely to be true. All the time we're trying to find the correspondences with what's actually going on in the world out there. And the world out there is, is, is really quite complicated in itself, and becomes more complicated the more we go after it. In, even <coughs> including history, there's information still coming out about things which we thought we knew. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, I mean, they found things about Stonehenge this past week, <coughs> which is fascinating, because of course they hadn't dug in all the places. The more they dig, the more they find. And it becomes more and more complicated, even the subject which you think must be pretty fixed, because they built the damn thing 3,000 years ago. What more can we find out about it? Well, 
Well, mm. it's but they're often the things that you know least about. Mm. But yeah. So whatever, exactly. So you know, this is what you're talking about. And so all the time is, where is the ne where is the next breaking information going to come through? You know, these metal detectors seem to have found all sorts of things. Which, I mean, they were cursed, and then the, uh, the archaeologists used to think that this would be ridiculous that amateurs should be going around stamping around farmers' fields finding things. But just look what they found. You know, in in the past 20 years, the things that they found about Anglo-Saxon civilization. Because nobody bothered to look in the farmers' fields, you know. We 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 dug up in places where the, we we knew, if you like, things were supposed to have happened. Mm. And uh, yeah. Right now, this is something which um, I was fascinated by when I first read it at the age of 15. And um, it is, it was, as I say, this is the science which is shaky. But just look at what he talks about. And he's done. He's drawing a direct parallel between consciousness, which he says has has evolved rapidly in the last um, 2,000, 3,000 years to the <coughs> sense of colour. Where are we? we are on the second sheet, page two, sorry. And we've just read the, the, the language one and we're going to read the next one, which hasn't got a number, which would be seven. It's page number two. Thank you. Much more modern than the birth of intellect was that of the colour sense. We have the authority of Marx Muller for the statement. It is well known that the distinction of colour is of late date, that Xenophanes, Xenophanes, Xenophanes yeah. knew of three colours of the rainbow only. Purple, Redan, yellow. No, that's red and yellow. That's oh, my typing, excuse me. I just wondered whether it was <laughs> some <laughs> technical term. <laughs> red and, okay. Uh, the colours of the rainbow only, purple, red and yellow, that even Aristotle spoke of the tri tricoloured rainbow and that the Democritus knew of no more than four colours, black, white, red and yellow. Hmm. And Muller finds no Sanskrit root for those meanings, sorry, whose meanings has any reference to colour. Right, so the root language we've just been talking about has no references to colour in it at all. So what that's suggesting is that 5,000 years ago, when that language was current, there was no usage of the word colour, of, of words for colour. Sorry, carry on. That is to say, the primitive Aryan, not more than 15 to 20,000 years ago, did not distinguish any difference in tint between the blue sky the green trees and grass, the brown or grey earth, and the golden and purple clouds of sunrise and sunset. Right. Mm. That's a co that concept I found amazing. Mm. Mm. And the evidence, of course, is anecdotal in the sense that we haven't, it's what we haven't got. There are no references to it in the old poems and the old stories that are written. And it gets, it gets even deeper. I, I think that's very. I think that's very good, actually, because um, trees aren't necessarily green and grass mm. isn't necessarily green. Mm -hmm. And what what we've done actually now is we have a very limited uh, number of words for colours mm -hmm. uh, in general use. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if you don't have any words for colours, then every time you look. The sky is a different colour. Yep. So how can you say the sky is blue mm -hmm. when it ain't necessarily so? Mm -hmm. But isn't it fascinating that, that these languages don't seem to have any words for any of them? So that they couldn't distinguish. They, I wouldn't be able to say to you, it's a bit, a bit grey today. No, or but maybe, that, maybe that's why. It's a bit bluer than it was grey, yesterday. Or just grey, look at it? that wonderful orange sunset. You know, which, which, which inch of sky are you looking at to say, oh, it's grey? Yeah. Because over there it may be something quite different. There is That's true, but you do have a meaning. If I said to you, the sky is grey today, you've got a good concept of what it's like. And if I just sort of say, it's that... It's this that is a concept. It's not really what it is. Isn't that, all, isn't that all we've been saying all night? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you, get, if you haven't got a word, you can't even give me what you've got as a concept. There is an alternative possible explanation. Go on. 
that the human eye hadn't developed. Yes, that's what he's say saying. That. About, yeah, yeah, at that yeah. stage. That's what I got. From he me. is saying that, but but he's saying that the, the color was there. Yeah, mm. of course, in the universe. Yeah but it hadn't been responded to. Yeah. And then you get this, this wonderful philosophical point which they talk about the um, yes. multiple yes. worlds. Yeah. Is if no one's conscious of it, is it there? Yeah. <laughs> but animals see colours quite differently to us, don't they? Well, he, he goes on to say there's quite a, di quite a range of colour reception by human beings. One in five of us is colourblind to some degree. Recognisably colourblind. So, you know, more if you're a man. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. Three in one colour. Is that right? Yeah. And I mean, we're talking about quite subtle ones, but there are a lot of people who suffer from big and don't see any colours at all. Now, what Book is saying is that these, that therefore, for these people, they were not conscious of them. This is a development thing. He's saying this is an evolutionary process. People are becoming more colour sensitive. He's going to go on to say, we didn't have a musical sense as well, because there's no reference to musical sense in the language either. And no references to fragrances. Now, when you, you see, this is something which I, I cannot accept as being a law or being a rule, but it certainly shakes me to the fact that people, so that when, in, in the Odyssey, when, when Homer talks about the wine dark sea, you, you think to yourself, what the hell does he mean by that? The wine dark sea. There's no wines which are deep blue. And I mean, in Greece, the sea is deep blue. It isn't red in any oh, sense. It's you not. Can see it you can see it wine dark. You can? I believe you can see right. it wine dark. Yes, I've seen well, it. Well, I, I find mm. that concept disturbing. Disturbing in the sense that I don't understand mm. exactly. And he, he does refer to it many times. It's a repeated um, motif to the mm. thing like the rosy fingered dawn. It's exactly the, the same sort of thing again. But then book goes on and says that, mm. as we'll see. Let's press on because he gives a few more details to this. Um, would anyone like to take it a stage further? Please, Pam. Yeah. In the Ridge Vader, there are hundreds of descriptions of the sky and no mention of a colour. In the Zen of Esther, the heavens are meticulously described and the colours not mentioned. In the Bible, the sky and heaven are mentioned more than 430 times. And, as in Greece and Asia Minor, this intensely blue contrasting sky is never mentioned. According to this law, the energy, the power of exciting vision of the red rays is several thousand times as great as the energy of the violet and there is a regular and steady decrease of energy as we pass down the spectrum from red to violet. Exactly what ancient literature and etymology tell us takes place. Yes, because the first colour they start to mention are red and black. And then they start to notice yellow, and it comes through the, down through the intensity that he's describing. Now, I have... Now, I haven't checked his, his readings, and I haven't checked it, but he's, he's referring constantly to anthropologists like Muller and people who've done research in the field. That's <coughs> not his research he's referring to, and Muller is still recognised as an authority in the area of sort of ethnic, ethnic groups. So he's, he's digging on solid science basis, which is still recognised now, although it has been far more complicated. But the references which he's making are there. So, if I don't, can you read that? Is that diagram readable to you? Yeah. I can okay. see the words now. I can see the words now. <laughs> once you've once you said that, I can read them now. Yeah. So what he's, he's given, the, literally, the, uh, in terms of how he's seen the evo evolution of the colour sense in human beings. And it tallies with the, mm -hmm. the nature of colour blindness that, as it appears in patterns. He goes into lots of details with this and, and proves it to his satisfaction and he certainly got me questioning yeah. my understanding but the, I mean this is a stuff which of course we could never nail down finally in a scientific sense but it certainly looks as if there has been an evolution certainly of our reception of color and whether this is because of the nature of the eyeballs or the brain sensors which are actually coming to terms with this but an awful lot of animals don't seem to recognize color in anything like the way we do some of them do some of them respond to colours that we can't see. You know, they, they respond to things beyond infrared or beneath ultraviolet. 
colours that we <laughs> cannot see, and they're present in flowers to attract insects, etc. So yes, there are vibrations that can be seen. But <laughs> as he points out, it, is it just coincidence that the, that the red is actually the most intense uh, energy light wave that we can that we can measure, and that was the first one that seemed to appear with black, which would be the least. And that from that black comes out blue, etc. The, the, the primitive people seem to see black and blue as one colour. Just like the Chinese didn't have a word for sheep and goats, they had one word for both. Did they not distinguish the fact that they were two different species and that they couldn't interbreed? Well, they must have done, but it, didn't, it wasn't obviously important to them enough to be able to talk about it because they hadn't got a word for it. So they might have said those <laughs> those tall sheep with the big horns that climb mountains. <laughs> oh yes, those. Yeah, well, I mean, eventually you get a shorthand and you say the goats. You mean? <laughs> yeah. But they never got to that stage. Yes. And we, even now we don't have a singular for cattle. We only have the male or the female. We don't have a we don't have a cat. You know, we cat. Yeah. And for sheep, the word that singular is the same as the plural, because of course the Anglo-Saxons didn't have the same plural systems as we did. So you have one sheet, and you also have eight sheets. There aren't many words you can do that where the plural is the same as the single. Mm -hmm. It shows us that they come from a different language. It wasn't the Latin-based sort of English that we did. So it isn't cow the same? No, because that's, a, that's only a female. It doesn't, you can, if you saw over there a cattle, uh, right, you can't okay. say, I can see a cattle. You'd have to <laughs> guess whether it was a bull or a, or a cow. Yes, okay. You haven't yeah, got a word for, us, for, the, for the genus. Yeah. Mm. And the, the other one which is fascinating, I think we may have pointed this out, that it's Anglo-Saxon words for the animal and it's always French words for the meat. <laughs> so you have cattle, but you eat beef. <laughs> you have sheep, but you eat mutton. Mutton. Yeah. You have pigs, but you eat pork. So, obviously, the Normans ate them, and we just looked after them in the field. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrifying, isn't it? Language, you see, these remnants carry with them so much meaning. So much meaning. And you haven't noticed that. You brought it up. No, you know, so when a child says there's several sheepses out there, mummy, they're right and we're wrong. Mm. You know, and why? Why do? Why does a pig? You know, give you pork? You know? mm -hmm. So how would you? Hug? How, well, <laughs> how would you translate the meaning of the cosmic consciousness that you become exposed to when you're limited in your your concepts are limited by your language? Completely. Yes. So you know. Well, you, you get this sudden flash of, according to him, yeah. this sudden flash of inspiration. Mm -hmm. right? Except it, it presumably means nothing to you as far as trying to say what it is. Exactly. And well, what we could say it has a meaning, but you cannot, that meaning is locked inside you. You can't give it to anybody because no damned words for it. And if it's as as people constantly say, like Eugene and, and Brooke is saying, it's, 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 it is edgeless, it's got no forms inside it, you cannot describe anything which hasn't got a form. There's no, words only bounce off forms, and if you haven't got a form in this thing, you're stuck like the Buddha, and he says it's thusness, suchness, the suchness of things. He's, yeah, I, I get the feel of what he's saying, but I wish he'd be a bit more specific. <laughs> And if you look for the specifics, you will never get the thusness. So constantly people are trying to somersault backwards and give you the meaning for something with which there can be no meaning. Because it's beyond any formal thing. So, yes, and exactly that's why he's, he's got, as far as I'm concerned, the legitimacy when he says that when the Buddha means this, he means the same thing as St. Paul when he means that. And when, uh, when Dante means, says this, he means the same thing as that all of them, and they're all talking about the same thing, and the humans are going to slowly start moving towards it, whether they like it or not. You know? Which is what Mohammed says. Whether you like it or not, God is revealing himself in the world. Whether you, you know, he didn't ask you, you weren't at the meeting, it's going to happen. <laughs> and so, get on with it. <laughs> which is the attitude of Islam. You know? mm. You've got, it's coming at you. Right, so... Um, if you look at that, you can see that you've got the spectrum there, as it is at this moment. Because presumably, 
this is going to go on. And we can't talk about the colours we can't see them. But the universe has got a whole spectrum beyond the spectrum that we know and recognise. Animals can respond to it, machines can respond to it, the machines can see these things. Ultimately, presumably, human beings will start to find more colours than we have at the moment. Our eyes will start to respond to them in more specific ways. Now, we only have a certain number of rods and cones in our eyes, so whether they will change and develop, I don't know. Yes, they're still, I think it's still evolving. Yes. Mm. Yeah. As he talks about on those things, he talks about the, the horse developing there. We tend to think of a horse as one thing, but at one time they were the size of a cat, weren't they? Yeah. So we have to recognize that the horse thing <coughs> is really frozen in time for us. We see it as this noble creature, you know, which constantly costs me money on doggy day. But you know, they were at one time very little to me. <laughs> to say to you then was, okay, so we've heard Book's description of cosmic consciousness. The book is then... After he goes through the, oh, he then goes on to talk about the musical sense, and he's what he's saying to is, so when you're looking at art, you think you're doing something highly refined, and you are doing something highly refined, but it's a biological push, if you like, it's an evolutionary push, which is making you notice these damn things. And an artist is putting something down, which by your recognition, you're both actually bouncing this thing of, are we getting more sophisticated? And it's a consciousness thing that is being pushing through you. And when you hear music and those relationships and you're picking up the harmonies and stuff, this is something which is quite new to the human race, later than the color sense.